Welcome to Microbiome Minutes. My name is Whitney Kellum, a certified coach, and it is such an honor to have the opportunity to interview gut health expert Kiran Krishnan. So Kiran has over 15 years in research and development in molecular medicine and microbiology. That's a mouthful. <laughs> He's already done 50 lectures in the last 12 months with over 13 clinical trials and educating health professionals across the country in gut health. Welcome, Kiran. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and nerd out a little bit. I love yes, it. Yes, I love it so much. I love nerding out. No. And I love your probiotics. They're fantastic. Thank you so much. The first thing I wanted to kick it off with, because kombucha is such a big craze, and mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of probiotics that they have to keep refrigerated, and whenever I ask people about their probiotic regimen, they don't understand what to take. Can you mm -hmm. answer that question? Are all probiotics created the same? Uh, absolutely not. So probiotics are really a function of the types of strains that you have in there. Um, it's all about the quality of the strains. It's not the quantity. It's not the number of strains. It's not the CFU count, whether it's 50 billion, 200 billion, 300 billion. There's very little science behind going higher and higher dosing and higher and higher counts being beneficial. Um, most of the studies are surrounded uh, that surround probiotics uh, use only one or two strains at a few billion CFUs. So if we're matching the research, what we really want to do is be very specific in the types of strains that we select and, and very specific in how we use those strains. So just to dive a little deeper into that, so you want to be very specific. There's some that are refrigerated, mm -hmm. I've noticed, when you go into the store. What, tell me a little bit about the refrigeration process. Why are they keeping those cold? Yeah, and, and that's an unfortunate thing in the probiotic industry. So what started to happen, and I can give you a little bit of history of where this refrigeration even came from. So imagine you're a probiotic company and you've got a bottle of probiotics and it says 50 billion cells per, per two capsules, right? And it's sitting there on the shelf. Now, some class action lawyer is gonna come around when that bottle is four months on the shelf, pick it up, send it to a lab and do a test, and it may say 40 billion CFUs because some of those bacteria have died sitting there on the shelf. Now that class action lawyer is going to file a lawsuit and sue your company for false advertising because there's only 40 billion when you claim 50. So to help protect against that, companies started requiring their probiotics to be refrigerated because that puts the bacteria in kind of a dormant state to try to maintain that dose. And, and that was the whole tech, that's where this whole refrigeration thing came from. It had nothing to do with science. It's not like somebody did a clinical trial and said refrigeration makes the probiotics more effective and so on. It's just a legal thing to protect yourself and protect your brand. Now, what that also means is that these strains can't sit at 70 degrees at room temperature. You know, over time, they die at 70 degrees at room temperature, so they need to be kept cold. If they can't sit at room temperature at 70 degrees, how do they survive 98.6 degrees in the body? You know, so they can't. And that's one of my, that was one of my first investigations when I got into the probiotic space as a microbiologist, studying it from a science perspective. I looked at all the stuff that's highly recommended in the, in the refrigerator and said, these, these bacteria can't barely survive room temperature. They're not going to survive this harsh environment of the gut. And sure enough, when we tested them, most of them don't. Wow, that is so interesting. I think that will make a lot of sense to people. And I'm going to put mine in the refrigerator as soon as I get back in the house. <laughs> right. and knowing that I can travel with them if I keep them refrigerated when I'm home too, because they don't all die off. And it's just, there is a shelf life just like on anything. So that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And what about kombucha, the fad, the, the explosion? Can you tell me a little bit about your perspective on that? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, the one common misnomer, kombucha and other fermented products are probiotics, right? That's what people think of, but they're not probiotics. But, and they are useful in their own way, and I'll describe how they're useful. But a probiotic is a live microorganism when uh, administered at adequate amounts confers a health benefit to the host. So the first part of that scientific definition of a probiotic is it has to be a live mi microorganism that can go and live in your gut and create a change in your gut. Now, fermented products use organisms that are really good at fermenting the, the substrates, whether it's dairy or cabbage or sauerkraut or whatever it may be, in that condition, right? So they're really good at creating the ferment. Um, they're not good bacteria to survive the gastric system, go in and live in your gut. So fermented products, including kombucha, don't deliver probiotics, but they do deliver uh, pre-digested, highly nutritious food compounds. 
that are actually supportive to your native bacteria. So if you take a kombucha, and assuming the kombucha you're, you're choosing is not really high in sugar, which a lot of them are, and it's not really you know, high in flavoring and, um, and has too high of an alcohol content, which is another issue with a lot of kombuchas, assuming you're doing one or you're doing it yourself at home, uh, and you're consuming that, what you're getting with it is a whole bunch of organic acids and peptides and all of these wonderful nutritious things that are gonna be feeding the good bacteria on your gut and helping your body bring down inflammation. So I will never say that fermented foods are not valuable. They are valuable, they are nutritious, but they're not a source of probiotics. So you can't take your kombucha every morning and assume you're getting a probiotic. You actually need both. You need a fermented food and you need a probiotic. Wow, that's really helpful. And what I heard you say is that the fermented kombucha delivers the base where it, it sets the frame and then the probiotics actually implement or deliver the bacteria. There's no bacteria in kombucha. There, it's yeah. not giving you probiotics. It's, it's not gonna survive this, the gastric system. If you look at kombucha itself, a lot of times they stop the fermentation by, um, you know, by, by putting things in there that stop the bacteria from functioning or the fungus in the case of kombucha. Um, and, and then those, when you consume them, will die in the stomach, in the stomach acid. But you will get all the nutrients. So the best analogy for that is if your gut is a garden, it's a really diverse, lush garden, then probiotics are the plants and the fermented foods like kombucha are the fertilizer for the garden. So they're the food for the, for the important plants in your gut. I love your metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> it makes everything so much easier to understand in you know, metaphors. Oh, it's so easy to learn from you, Kiran. Well, thank you so much. And for those of you watching, I'm so excited because the next couple episodes are going to be right delivered to uh, the, the women in, uh, in our country and uh, in the world, actually, to better understand uh, what happens when you are going to be pregnant and have your baby to avoid having um, postpartum. And then the other thing we talked about, Kiran, which I'm really excited, is travel. When we travel, what happens to our gut? So we're going to bring you those next two episodes. I'm really excited. Thank you so much, Kiran. What a pleasure and an honor. And yeah. I appreciate your uh, wisdom. Thank you. Thank you.